for being here today as we continue our um, lecture series introducing Byzantine Christianity. And today is really an extension of last month's talk on a very well-known, at least within Orthodox Christian circles, a Byzantine mystic and theologian, Gregory Palamas. If you'd like to see that lecture, you can just look at YouTube. So Ryan has that telephone lectures on YouTube. So today, as I mentioned, is an extension of that talk in November. And uh, it's kind of an interesting title. Anyone remember the title as advertised? The Breath of the Father's Life and the Gift of His Love. Wow. <laughs> Breath. Life. Love. What more do we need? <laughs> so, it's all about the Holy Spirit. The very Spirit of God. And when we enter into that mystery, especially I think most of us are Roman Catholic Christians, at least originally, I think there are others that are raised Orthodox or have become Byzantine Rite or raised the Russian Byzantine Rite, but for most in the Latin Christian tradition, we had a sense, at least I did growing up, of wondering who on earth is the Holy Spirit? What are we talking about? And it didn't help that we referred to him as the Holy Ghost <laughs> when you were six or seven years old. <laughs> yeah. And when I was preparing for confirmation, which in the East is called chrismation and is administered to infants, so it's a totally different faith formation, uh, we were taught what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. And those were various virtues, various gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Sister Noreen impressed me several months ago by being able to rattle off <laughs> all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom and counsel and knowledge and, and piety and fortitude and fear of the Lord. And we learned these words, we memorized them, at least in the old formation and through the Baltimore Catechism. But um, at least the 12 and 13 year olds I remember who were confirmed, including myself, had very little idea what on earth we were talking about. <laughs> what was that, you know, the focus was on how hard was the bishop going to slap you when you were confirmed. And in case we are led to believe that that's something peculiar to 12 and 13 year olds, what we'll discover today is that the theology of the Holy Spirit and understanding of the Holy Spirit on the part of the church has grown and developed organically over the centuries and that from the early church and throughout those centuries, some of the greatest minds were contesting in, 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 in bitter argument with regard to the person and nature of the Holy Spirit. What are we talking about? And so the great fathers and doctors of the church struggled over this. Ecumenical councils of the church were held regarding this question. What are we talking about? What, who is the Holy Spirit? Probably the most accurate thing East and West have been able to say about the Spirit is that the Spirit is church in the Council of Nicaea, which is held in 325, put forth the creed that we recite, the Nicene Creed at Mass. And it gives us a basic idea of the God of creation. We say God the Father. 
and God the Son, begotten from the Father, the only begotten, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. This is the first articulation of the relationship within the one Godhead of divine persons, the relationship between the Father and the Son. And in the Greek, the word that was used to define that is homoosios, which means of the same nature, that the Father and the Son are of the same nature, that they share the same life, divine life. In the Nicene Creed, however, when we get to the Trinity, we simply say, in the Holy Spirit. There's just one line about the Holy Spirit. And so right from the get-go, from 325 until another council, which was held in Constantinople, One, the church, and I'm not talking about 12 or 13 year olds, <laughs> but grown men, fathers of the church who were bishops, theologians, were in deep conflict about who is this spirit, who is this Holy Spirit, and what is his relationship to the Father and to the Son. If you say, and these were some of the issues that they were trying to flush out, just as we as kids were trying to figure out, who in earth is this spirit? And it's interesting that sometimes children will ask you these kinds of questions. If you say, that there are three persons in one God, which the early fathers began to articulate by 381, getting close to that. St. Athanasius, St. Basil, St. Gregory, Nazianzen. Then the opposition was saying, are you saying that there is polytheism or tritheism. Are there three gods? You ever ask that? Mm -hmm. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Son and the Holy Spirit. Three gods? Is that what we say? Is that what the Nicene Creed professes? How could the Holy Spirit be God and the Son be God and the Father be God? On the other hand, if we say that the Father begets, generates the Son, and breathes forth the Spirit, and that's what the word in Latin means, spiritus, is breath, Holy Spirit, then are we talking, on the other hand, about subordinationism? that the Son and the Spirit somehow are actions or activities or modes of expression, emanations from the Father. That they're less than the Father. And they're not really fully God. Are there three gods? Or is there one God but the three persons are, two of them are subordinate to the other? At a certain point, you might say, well, who cares? Who cares? God knows. God's a mystery, remember, after all. But it mattered to Byzantine Christians in the fourth century, and it should matter to us as well because of what we profess to believe and the manner in which we worship. If you're worshiping, and you're really worshiping, as the Lord says, in spirit and in truth, then wouldn't you want to know who you're worshiping? 
Boys, boys God. What is God? And how does God's life enter into my own and change me from within? When we discussed Gregory of uh, Palma, Gregory Palamas last month, we talked about mystery in terms of the Godhead. We talked about the distinction between essence and energies. God in his essence, remember we discussed his totally transcendent. In our Byzantine Eucharistic prayer called an anaphora, we say ineffable, incomprehensible, inconceivable, incommunicable. That pretty much sums it up. I can't capture God in my mind or in my thoughts. I can't manipulate the divine. God is infinitely transcendent. God in and of God's self. And so the ontological nature of God, the essence of God, what theologians came to call the imminent trinity, is God in God's own inner life, God's self. And that we can't figure out. But we believe through scripture, through revelation, through the word of God, through our own worship, that that God has broken through and revealed something of himself to us in what theologians came to call the energies of God. Or the economic and that in that revelation in that self gift God tells us something about himself reveals himself manifests himself and that that is the God that we experience and worship it is the God of creation Of salvation of sanctification and these are not two different gods but one God that the God who we could otherwise never know makes himself known to us through his energies through his self communication through his gift of self gift of love and breath of life. And so the Father is seen in Byzantine Christianity as the God of the Old Testament, the God of the ancient covenant, the God who manifests or reveals himself through a relationship with the people, the people of God, and promises a further gift which is expressed through the ancient messianic hopes and promises of that people of ancient Israel. And so we have associated with creation the mystery of the first God, we, of the God we mentioned in the creed, God the Father. In the breath of the Father, in the Word of God, in the very truth of the Father's love, we have manifested in time and history His Son, His only begotten Son. His only begotten Son. And Jesus the Lord comes to be known in his relationship with the Father. He is the one sent from the Father. 
the economic trinity reveals to us the God of creation, who is also the God of salvation. That this Son, through whom all things were made, becomes himself one with, one of his own creation, in order to bring that creation to himself. We've mentioned in earlier lectures that the mystery that we articulate of God becoming with his own creation, called incarnation, the central mystery of Christianity, is not a saving plan only, but the fall of humanity necessitates another plan. Oh, look what they've done. They've ruined the master plan. <laughs> the fall of Adam and Eve. What shall I do? I guess I'll have to come up with plan B. Oh, I know, I'll send my son. He'll suffer and die, I'm sure he won't mind. And he'll write this check for atonement. In visiting Christianity, the incarnation is seen as plan A, not plan B. It's the original creative plan of God. And God the Father creates through his word, who is Son. Because God is not a substance. God is not a concept. God is not a thought or an idea. But primarily, primordially, and eternally, person, capital P. And this person is relationship. And so the Father does what he does as person who is love, which is generated from all eternity, his son. And we call that the beginning or generation, which is not subordinationism. It doesn't imply subordinationism, but the son is fully, as Nicaea said, equal to, one in divinity with the father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, one in being with the father. They articulate this as clearly as they can to avoid the mystery that led to various interpretations in the early church. Who are you worshiping? Nicaea is the first attempt in 325 to clarify that for people. Why do we need to clear? Because we're rational creatures. And we're called to worship in spirit and in truth. So who are we worshiping? Something we've made up or the God who reveals himself in and through his son through whom all things were made. So creation takes place through the Son of the Father. And creation takes place through the other gift of the Father, which is his love. Salvation takes place in and through the Son, who joins to himself as a divine person, both a divine and a human nature, and achieves for us what is called redemption. After the fall, the original plan of God in creating all, which is the incarnation, necessarily becomes a saving plan. It's almost like a subnote. Right? Yes. So it, it's, it's the, the, the incarnation was meant to be. We take St. Paul at his words. All was created through him. All was created for him. He is before all else that is. He's plan A, the master plan. It's all about Christ. And he comes in order that God might disclose, reveal himself, that they might be no longer saying, who is this God? That God might say, I created you. And I'm not a concept and I'm not a thing, you know, God spray. <laughs> I'm person, capital P. And I'm love. And I generate my son as father, who is one with me in this mystery of God. And that Son, who is equal to, one with the Father, the very word, the very image, the very truth of the Father's love, 
becomes one with one of his own creation in order to bring that creation to himself. In order to bring about what only love can do and wishes to do, which is transforming union. Union of God with his people. Union of the uncreated with the created. Union of spirit with matter. Union of the divine with the human. And that only in God does the creation of God find its fulfillment, its destiny. Only in spirit does matter find its full realization, its destiny. Not in matters of liberation, but in its spiritualization, its transformation by love. And all of this is accomplished by the Son in the words and the deeds that we see and hear recorded and celebrated in the Gospels and in our full life as church. But, great Greek Nancy Anson, great Byzantine mystic and theologian, we call deep theologian in Byzantine Christianity in the fourth century when all these questions started arising. What about this spirit? There were a lot of people at the time, they were called Arians, who didn't want to admit this unity of the Father with the Son. And felt that to say that the Son was begotten eternally by the Father, even eternally, they still said he's a creation. He himself is a creation of the Father. And there was a long time in the history of the church where Arianism seemed to prevail and would have prevailed, except for the constant efforts of a handful of theologians like Athanasius, Basil, and the great Nazianzus, and the councils of the church, all of which were held in the East, by the way. None of this was going on in the Latin West. This all, all this was being hammered out, worked out, talked about, debated in the, in the East. So it has relevance to us in terms of what we've inherited, what we believe, what we say we believe, why we believe it. Because someone told you, who is God for you? All of this matters for you. Who is this God in my life? And so homoousios, the same nature, becomes an essential part of defining the relationship between the Father and the Son. What about the Spirit? Even those who accept homoousios, that the Father and the Son are one, say, no, the Spirit is just an emanation, is simply an attribute, is simply an action of God, not God himself. Even Athanasius and Basil, even in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, they're, they're just in the, in, the, in the power of the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit at the end of the creed, in the glory of God the Father, amen. The Holy Spirit is acknowledged as one with the Father and the Son, but it's not clear. It's not clarified fully. It's only in the work of Gregory and Nazianzus that, that the church comes to say, finally, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But there is a circle of love in this relationship. And that the truth of God is not fully the truth except in love. And that the dual gift of the Father, the breath of the Father's life, is His Word, His Son, who isn't an abstract concept, but Son in relation to person, who is love, and that very love itself, who is Spirit, the very breath of the Father's life. Otherwise, Christ, without that love, simply becomes an abstraction. His incarnation becomes an abstraction. He becomes an ethical teacher, a philosopher that is one among others who gives us a good way of living our life. You know, be nice, do good to others, pay your taxes, stop at red lights. <laughs> and tasks to be performed, which are part of being a good person, all, all important. But 
what's lacking in that? What's lacking in that is the possibility for this, transforming union, the whole point of the creation, to bring creation into God's own life. Not the essence of God, but through the energies of God, through, through the economic trinity, through the trinity, through God revealing God's self in creation, salvation, and sanctification, saying, you're part of the picture. It's not just God being God. And we sit there like in a movie theater watching it happen. Or we wonder what's happening because we have no access to the essence of God. God breaks through, if you will, his ontological nature. And in his creative, saving, and sanctifying love, brings us into his own life. So the Spirit is the breath of the Father's life and the gift of his love that enables us to no longer wonder about God, but to enter into the life of God as our own. It is the Spirit that makes possible then that what the Son accomplishes for us, which is an objective redemption, Yes, he suffers, he dies on the cross, he's buried, he rises again. He restores this original relationship, objectively speaking, for all of humanity, this relationship between God and his people. But that redemption is a love story. It's not a contract. It's not a bill that needs to be paid. It's a love story. And love is not unilateral, but Bilateral. There has to be a synergy of wills. And so for the object of redemption to become subjective in my life, I have to make it my own. How do I do that? My own efforts? My own willpower? I can do that. Yeah, sure. I can bridge the gap between good and evil. I can, I can be godlike of the time. I can become one with God by my own will and efforts. Oh, my God, it's on <laughs> Five minutes after that, <laughs> and you've either readjusted your self-image or you're in a psych ward. <laughs> so how does it happen? God in me. Through what? That very breath of the Spirit, which is the life of the the incarnation in its fullness is not just the enfleshment of the Word, the Son, who, who, who accomplishes an objective redemption. That objective redemption still awaits its fulfillment. How? It's a gift. The gift is there, waiting for me. But I have to receive it. I have to notice it's there and want it and take it into my life. And it's the Spirit who accomplishes that for me and for us. So, what that means is that my life, in order to have fullness, meaning, value, to be everything I'm created to be, which is one with God, my life, the only real life I'll ever have, has to be a participation in the life of God. That's a different way of looking at my life and evaluating it. The meaning of my life is measured by the degree of my participation in the very life of God. Because without the life of God, I don't even exist. I wasn't created in the first place, nor was I saved, nor can I be sanctified, which means enter into transforming the union. So the whole purpose of this synergy of wills, of receiving the gift of the redemptive action of the Son, is to enable me to live that life of God. 
to make the objective redemption subjective, in other words, fully assimilated within my own life. To become Christ. Not just to think about him, talk about him, speculate about him, write about him, follow him in terms of imitating certain virtues, but to have his life, which is the life of the Father, in me, and I in him. Abide in me as, 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 as the, the vine on, on the, uh, the branches on the vine. If I'm cut off from that vine, then I have no possibility of abiding in him. How do I abide, abide in him? He says, I will give you this gift, the comforter, the gift of the spirit. And so those who claimed, even those who accepted the oneness of the Father and the Son, but in the fourth century were saying, yes, okay, we'll go that far, but the Spirit is a created entity. The Spirit is an emanation, an action, a mode of being of the Trinity, but he's not God. If the Spirit is created, then the Spirit cannot enter into my soul. The Spirit cannot enter into me and allow me to receive this gift and make it subjective in my life, the gift of redemption, the gift of oneness with God. Only the uncreated can enter into a created soul. Only the divine can enter into my innermost being and heal and enlighten and transform me from within those innermost depths of my being. And so Gregory Nazianzen, for example, this great saint of the Holy Spirit, Byzantine theologian, said, the Holy Spirit, based upon biblical evidence, based upon the living tradition of the church, based upon what we know of God's self-revelation, is God, is God, and reveals God to us as one, but not a oneness of substance in the sense of, as I was saying, God spread. One in essence, and yet that essential reality is a reality of persons, because it is a reality of love, and therefore it is relational. And because it's divine, it's eternal. It has no beginning and no end. And so the essence of God then opens up to me as person. The person of the Father begetting his Son, generating his Son. The person of the Spirit being breathed forth by the Father's love, that same love. And this dual gift of the Father's love is an intra-Trinitarian relationship. Within the mystery of the Trinity itself, prior to and aside from God revealing himself, God is Father, who eternally generates his Son, and breathes forth, or the Latin is spirates, but breathes for spiration, spirates the spirit. Which we call procession, which is to say, uh, breathes forth. And that that essence of God, that inner Trinitarian relationship, is the same God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies. It's not two gods, the essence of one God and the energies, the economic trinity, the energies of another God. That this God is the same God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who creates and saves and sanctifies. And that each of these persons is fully God. But there are three gods but one. 
The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Spirit is Lord, but there are not three Lords but one Lord. There aren't three gods. At the same time that the Father begets the Son and, 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 and brings forth the Spirit, the Spirit proceeding from the Father, as Byzantine Christianity believes, this does not suggest that the Son and the Spirit are created by the Father or are less in honor or dignity or equality with the Father. They are not in any way subordinate to the Father. There are three persons filled with the same love and that whenever the Father and the Son and the Spirit reveal themselves in creation and sanctification and salvation, the whole trinity is involved. Who created the world? God. Who is God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons. The whole trinity creates. Who saved us? Who redeemed us? Jesus Christ. Yes. Who else? Most people don't, don't continue to bring it forth to its final conclusion, which is that the Father and the Holy Spirit are also part of that same redemptive act. We don't know how, but somehow in his love the Father participates in the mystery of the cross, the humiliation, the self-surrender of the cross. And the Spirit is there in every action of Christ, the Spirit who descends like a dove upon the Lord in his baptism is the same spirit who is somehow there in the mystery of death and resurrection itself. Death and burial in the tomb. There's the Holy Spirit right there. Death and life, death, burial, and life are the work not just of the Son, but of the entire Trinity. Because one cannot act without the other. The distinction between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is not a distinction of equality. They're equal in nature. They're dog do and God, like the light. But of relationships. Of relations of persons. And in the economic trinity, that means that the Son has a different relationship with the Father and thus a different role to play in creation, salvation, and sanctification than the Spirit. In other words, the Son is equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit without being the Father of the Holy Spirit. The Son is only begotten. Is the Father begotten? No, he's the one who begets. Is the Spirit the one begotten? No, but breathed forth by the Father. Does the Son breathe forth the Spirit? No, only the Father. And so in terms of their relationships of persons, their role in creation, salvation, and sanctification. These are real persons, capital P. They have a different role. It's not, again, like God's spray. God created, God saves, God sanctifies. Who are we talking about? God is love. Love is not a substance, but a person, capital P. Love gives itself away as the Father begets the Son. And that very gift is the breathing forth in love of the Spirit. God cannot be anything other than one, and he cannot be anything other than Trinity. And only that God, who was one in threeness of persons, has created us for that same oneness in community, in relationship, in love. And only the Spirit coming upon us with that love, which is a Trinitarian love, can allow us to receive the objective gift of redemption subjectively into our hearts and begin to live in love by not just our own power, but by God's power. And he can only do that if the Spirit himself is God. As God, able to enter into your soul, able to not just clean up, tidy up, but heal from within, restore from within lost relationships with God and with one another. That the Spirit therefore becomes God continuing the saving work of the Son in creation. 
The same Spirit who breathes forth over the waters in creation is the same God, Spirit, love of the Father, breath of the Father's life, who wants to bring that work of the Son to completion in you and in me and in the world and indeed in the entire cosmos. It is that spirit who descends upon a young girl and changes everything for her, inhabits her, the very person of the, of the spirit. Not a gift, not an emanation, but a divine person enters into the small p created person of the Virgin Mary and enters into a transforming union such that this plan of the Father for the enfleshment of the Son is brought about in and through her. A synergy of wills, not something unilateral. And grab this young girl and, and just like joining the Peace Corps for nine months. I, I, you can do this and then go back to your natural life. No, he enters her, she enters in through the fullness of her will into this mystery of love and makes it her own. That's what love did. Love has to be too, a mutual synergy of wills. And that same love then that makes the incarnation possible makes possible our entrance into that incarnation. What do we call that? Church. That we become members, living members of one body. Christ the head, we the members of a church. Not an institution, not a bunch of rules and regulations of a particular denomination, but the very body, mystical body of Christ. And how can we do that? Only if we are filled with the Spirit ourselves and become the dwelling place of the Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that church then becomes such through what the Spirit makes possible, which is the last thing that the Son bequeaths to us, which is himself in the context of the meal. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in memory of me. Memory of what? What will happen the next day? His death. His death. And resurrection that unites us to the Father in love. In every Eucharist, we continue that saving reality in the here and the now. How? By the same power that creates and participates in salvation and brings it to fulfillment and sanctifies us, not a power, but a person, capital P, called the Holy Spirit, who is God, alone able to accomplish this. That bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ in every Eucharist. How? The power of the Spirit, epiclesis. And that that epiclesis is not just over bread and wine, but over you and me, that we become he whom we receive, Christ, which is to say the whole Trinity dwelling in you and in me as one. No longer isolated. No longer alone. And if that becomes true of us and we take it seriously, then that sacramental reality, that Christification, if you will, of all things, affects the world. Affects the whole cosmos. We could call it the Eucharistization of the whole cosmos. Why? Because the Spirit co-creates the Father and the Son, the whole of the cosmos, in order for it, through the Son, to be brought back to the Father. That our worship has to reflect the very God who creates and saves and sanctifies us, the Father, through the Son, in the power of His Spirit. Our worship has to bring back to God that same ordered reality of relationship. We pray, therefore, we worship in spirit and in truth only if we're praying in the spirit, through the Son, to the Father. That's why we pray in our prayer, oh God, Father, hear us through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. What is that unity? The unity of the Trinity, the persons in one Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The unity of love that alone creates, saves, and sanctifies us. That unity which alone can form us as church and enable us to be a participant in the very life of God 
and to bring that same unity, not just within my own self, my private self, there's no more private self than the power of the Spirit and His love. Everything I become, everything I do, affects everyone else. The spiritualization of the cosmos. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to bring the objective redemption to the subjective level for each human being and indeed for all of matter, for all of creation. So everything, the destiny of all, <coughs> depends upon who we say the Spirit is. And how we pray is affected by whether or not the Spirit is God or simply a thought, an idea, or an emanation of God. And if the Spirit of God is in me, then the Spirit can be within me, transforming me into the Son and through the Son into the Father's love. And suddenly, again, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in me, the Trinity within And so these early Byzantine fathers of the church were not just bored theologians <laughs> in the fourth century wondering what to think about, what to, what, to, what to argue about, you know. Oh, church people, you know, talk, 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 and the sorry. No, this meant everything to them because, and, and for future generations because of who is God? Who is the, who is the God that you worship? And so, the question of the 12-year-old or 13-year-old preparing, at least when I was a child, now they're older, preparing for confirmation is the same question. Who is the Holy Spirit that I receive? And Chris mentioned, of course, in the Byzantine Church, but it's the same reality, the same sacrament. What does it mean to me that God is not out there but within me, closer to me than I am to myself? The Holy Spirit makes that oneness possible. And if the Spirit isn't God, the Spirit cannot accomplish that unity that transforms the union of love, that conforms me with the unity of the Trinity, which is the fullness of life and light and love, the breath of the Father's life, the gift of his love, which is the light of his Son, who comes into the world to be exactly that. Psalm 36 says, in your light we will see light, the Spirit, therefore, must be that light, God himself, through whom we see the Son for who he is. It is that very light that is revealed in the transfiguration, that cloud of light that surrounds the Lord in his transfigured glory before Peter, James, and John, with Moses and Elijah on either side. The mystery of the law, the mystery of the prophets fulfilled not in them, but in the Lord, and revealed to Peter, James, and John. They're enveloped by that light. They're only able to see that light of the Lord transfigured if they themselves have become transfigured, if they themselves are in the light, and that light is already the spirit in the cloud that envelops them, the dwelling place, checking on of God himself. And that same gift of light, of life, and of love is what we receive in our baptism, is what we receive in chrismation or confirmation, is what we receive in the Eucharist, by which we become he whom we receive. And then we are led by that same spirit to, as church, be the sacramental witness, the heralds of the good news, the instruments of God's love in the world awaiting its life and the spirit. The true life, the only true life for you, for us, and for the whole world is a participation in the life of God. And God is person. Three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And has revealed God's self in order that we might enter into that relationship of persons and become made new. us for today as we have touched very briefly on the Holy Spirit for a surface level but um, uh, a discussion on the various controversies of the early centuries and why they make sense not just historically but even for us today as we attempt to worship and to love God 